Now, live with Greg Olson, director of the New York State Office for the Aging. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks so much for joining us. My name is Greg Olson. I'm the director of the New York State Office for Aging and so excited to have back for the third straight year my good friend and colleague, Beth smith Boyvin from the Alzheimer's Association of Northeastern New York. But we are live from Rockland County, from the Active Rockland Physical Therapy and Wellness Center, um, which is a part social adult day And then next to it has occupational therapy, PT, pain management, exercise in the Palisades Mall here in Rockland. It's amazing. We've spent the day with uh, Ageless Innovation, um, uh, the CEO, Ted Fisher, doing uh, games with older adults with dementia and their caregivers. Just absolutely spectacular. I want to thank Richard Serrano for, for hosting us today. So holiday gatherings can be very unsettling for individuals with dementia or Alzheimer's disease, and caregivers may also feel enormous stress and anxiety, especially during the holidays. But there are ways to ease into holiday traditions, creating a safe and inclusive environment. That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, If you have any questions on today's program, please put them in the chat box, and we will address them later in the program. But before we begin, we'd like to talk a a lot about things that caregivers can do, not only during the holidays to plan, but in general. And one very, very effective tool for future planning for individuals over the age of 50 is called the TEPSAT, the Elder Preparedness Self-Assessment Tool. Take a look at this short video and please do this over the holidays with your family. Hi, my name is Greg Olson and I'm the director of the New York State Office for Aging. When you need to replace your refrigerator, maybe a washer or dryer, or how about a vehicle? Do you do a little bit of research first before you make that big purchase? The answer is of course you do. What we don't do is plan very well for getting older, understanding what to think about, what to plan for, what services might be available, who pays for them, and it can be very complex, but it is truly necessary. I wanna introduce you to the TEPSAT, which is a fantastic planning tool. A perfect time to do the TEPSAT is when you gather over the holidays. Please share it with your friends, family, and neighbors, and sit down and get yourself prepared for the things that you need to think about as you grow up and grow older. Please take a look at the link below and take the TEPSAT tool over the holidays. Well, Beth, it is great to see you. Thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, This is a a real popular topic, and... um, you know, you, you are so good at providing just doable things that think people need to think about or tips um, mm-hmm. 12 months a year, but the holidays are different. So why are the holidays sometimes stressful for people with Alzheimer's disease and dementia? And what can people do to reduce that stress? Sure. So I think this, the holidays can be sometimes stressful for everybody. Um, but particularly for people with Alzheimer's and dementia, because um, in light of the deficits that occur with Alzheimer's disease, and I'm sure we'll talk about that in just a moment, Greg, um, people have difficulty being overstimulated. They also have difficulty when their routine is disrupted. So a normal routine, calm environment are key critical things for people living with this disease. And of course, the holidays tend to be anything but staying in routine and having nice, calm, quiet events. So I think it's, it can be stressful on those with Alzheimer's disease and dementia, but it can also be stressful for their care partners who are trying to plan these events, who are trying to ensure that their loved ones are able to participate and enjoy those moments while not trying to overtax them. So I think today's discussion is so important because we can talk about how to mitigate the stress for individuals with Alzheimer's and dementia while also ensuring that they can participate in those traditions that perhaps they still remember and have come to love. Right. And Beth, you mentioned to me a a term that I was hoping that you could describe. 
um, called adjusting expectations. What, what do you mean by that? Absolutely. So, you know, just we say all the time at the Alzheimer's Association that if you know one person with Alzheimer's disease, you know one person. And so everybody knows their loved ones best. And everybody then, all the care partners that are out there, are the best people to identify what works best for your loved one and how do you adjust the holiday plans that you may have had 10 years ago where 50 families, or perhaps that's an over-exaggeration, maybe four families of people gather together under one roof and there are 10 or 12 grandkids running around and there's gift giving and there's noise. And perhaps now you adjust the expectation to say, because someone in our family has Alzheimer's disease and all of that is too much stimulation, we'll have one family on Christmas Eve, one family on Christmas morning and one family on Christmas afternoon. That will ensure that the visits are taking place while not overstimulating the person with dementia, who most often, Greg, will take that out on their primary care partner. So if it's a set of grandparents, for example, the person who will pay the price for one part of that couple being overstimulated is the other pair. Yeah, and when you talk about, you know, stimulation, so I'm thinking of, you know, growing up in my own family or being uh, with others or watching TV. And what you see is a person maybe with dementia or Alzheimer's disease uh, sitting in a chair by themselves and not being engaged. And, you know, I wanted to ask you because engagement should never end. I think what you're talking about is how you do that differently. But how might a family member involve a person uh, with dementia or Alzheimer's disease and holiday preparations so that it's they're included um, and they're participatory and it's enjoyable? Right. You know what, Greg, that's such a good point. And it's something that I don't think we've we've talked a whole lot in years past about that primary caregiver and sort of the families and the global topics. But you raise a really important point, and that is making sure that everybody understands how to engage the person with Alzheimer's and dementia or dementia. And that really means understanding it. So perhaps before the visit, it would be useful for parents or grandparents to talk with children about how to engage the person that has Alzheimer's and dementia. Now, a key component of that is, of course, remembering that individuals with Alzheimer's and dementia have difficulty remembering new information, and it's because of the very pathology of the disease. They have trouble storing new data, but they're often able to remember those old traditions, they are able to enjoy the holiday music, particularly if they have um, a proclivity to religious music that they like. They're able to enjoy the sights, the smells, the tastes of the holidays that were always special to them. So I think it would be a good practice to talk to your children and say, you know, if grandma or grandpa, whatever the case is, Um, perhaps repeats themselves or tells stories about because they're remembering things that are very special to them. So we should all listen and learn about those stories that grandma and grandpa had from the past. That way it won't startle a younger person or cause them to want to correct or bring somebody into the, the present. And just by by matter of uh, coincidence, we have brochures at the Alzheimer's Association specifically for talking with your children and talking with your teens about how to engage with people with Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, I, I think that is so important. And what you just said is really demonstrating where we are today. You know, we're playing Absolutely. Scrabble and card games and the game of life and Trivial Pursuit. And they absolutely uh, remember how to play those games and the smiles and joy that we have just uh, seen um, right. is is really amazing. The other thing you mentioned is talking about stories. So, you know, mm-hmm. whether you're 70, 80 or 90, think of, uh, you know, if you're 90 years old, you're going back to the 1930s mm-hmm. and what those experiences are. I remember the mayor of Rochester, I was on a panel with him in February and he said, every time an older adult dies, a library burns down. And I'll never forget that. So take that time, as you're saying, for people to 
reflect on the things that they do me- remember, their experiences, you know, life, family, and and otherwise. Yeah. One of the things you said last year, which I I, I think is um, really amazing, are that there are unique gift ideas for persons with mm-hmm. Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So what are some mm-hmm. of those? Mm-hmm. So, so again, relying on, a, a, with the basis in mind, the knowledge about what happens when people have Alzheimer's disease and dementia, it begins with an inability to store new data. <coughs> So those old data, the old information is stored there in the cortex for a very, very long time. And so we wanna rely on that. We want to listen to old music. We wanna watch old movies or old television shows. And because people have difficulty storing new data, I often suggest to those folks that were avid readers that they reread old books because oftentimes the themes will come through in that remote or previously stored memory. There's a a great catalog out there um, called Al's Store, or a great, um, I guess, yeah, catalog is the the way I can describe it. It's an online store. You can go to alz.store and find all kinds of fabulous gift ideas for people with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And it includes all of these videos and Um, CDs of patriotic music or religious music or old Bonanza reruns or things that we can often find in some of the streaming channels now, but you can also find very easily through the Al's store as well. Al's store. Okay. We got to make sure that uh, we say that again before we end. And And I'm going to throw a couple, I'm going to throw a couple others out. Uh, Ageless Innovation has the animatronic pets, uh, which are a great Mm -hmm. gift and have been shown through studies and data to uh, really be beneficial to people with dementia. The intergenerational games are also through Ageless Innovation. Um, You can check those out. Uh, Great for the holiday. You turn your TV off, put your cell phone down and play. Uh, Also Relish Life uh, that designs products specifically for people with Alzheimer's. Uh, Things like radios, um, uh, puzzles and painting. So those are a couple other ideas, but you can get that list from you, from where again, Beth? From the Alzheimer's Association, either alz.org or calling our office. And awesome. the, yeah, the other thing, Greg, is that again, um, leaning on this notion of people loving old things from the past, um, bring in or bring up from the basement those old high school and college yearbooks, the wedding album from 1935. All of those things will trigger a whole host of joyful memories and discussion. So using those tools is is so helpful as well, or or perhaps making them as a gift. That's a great idea. So let's talk about this new era of treatment that we're Mm -hmm. in. There's a couple new drugs. Who are they for? And what are the 10 warning signs that people should be looking for? Well, maybe not looking for, maybe they'll notice. I think, and the reason I ask you that is because for far too long, people are afraid to think that they might have Mm -hmm. um, Alzheimer's disease or dementia, but putting your head in the sand and and hoping that it goes away is not a a solid strategy. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. And everything you just asked, Greg, is so interconnected. I think you're absolutely right. For many years, I think two of the greatest barriers to diagnosing Alzheimer's disease early was the fact that people were either afraid of getting it or they didn't fully understand the earliest signs. I think so many people out there have an image of Alzheimer's disease as that individual who perhaps is living in a nursing home in a rocking chair, unable to do many things, But the truth is that in the earliest stage of Alzheimer's disease, people are highly functional. Many of them drive. I've had patients who are still working in the early stage of Alzheimer's, and yet they have subtle changes in their cognition and memory that are not normal. Now, why is this so important that we talk about this now and we observe those symptoms and we get an early diagnosis? Because in July of this year, the first disease modifying treatment received full approval from the FDA. But Greg, you said it, 
it is only available to those people who are in the very earliest stage of this disease. What does it mean for them? It is not a cure because there are many co-pathologies and many things happening in Alzheimer's, but it might mean as much as 18 months of 100% function, no decline wow. in an individual's life. And when we wow. think about that in the context of people who are willing to do chemotherapy for a cancer just to live six more months, people that we talk to in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease have said to me, in fact, one very poignantly, if I could have one more day of clarity with my family, I would try this treatment. But the key is early and accurate diagnosis, because if you are too late in the game, you are too late to have the medication, it simply won't be approved for you. And even if you could get it, it simply wouldn't be effective. So early and accurate diagnosis. So what does that mean? It means that we can't just look at memory as one of the 10 symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. We need to look at the memory and we need to note that the memory loss in Alzheimer's disease is quite specific. It is memory changes for new data. So don't let folks fool you. If they remember things that happened 30 or 40 years ago, but they don't remember this morning very accurately, they forget that the sun visited yesterday, they didn't remember going to the hairdresser on Tuesday. Those are clear signs of early Alzheimer's disease because that old data is well stored, but the new data isn't getting stored. In addition, if people are repeating the same story over and over again because they don't remember telling it, that's a warning sign. Difficulty with mathematical problems or simply handling numbers is an issue. Occasional episodes of getting lost, especially in familiar places word retrieval difficulties, feeling um, sad, depressed, or accusing people of taking things that perhaps you're simply misplacing because of the disease. All of these things are the warning signs. And I always advise families, go to our website, call our office. We will send you these warning signs. Each one has a paragraph describing precisely what to look for. If you see two or more, get to the doctor, have this discussion so you can access these treatments. Yeah, that, that is such good advice, Beth. And there was something that when you, you're with the Alzheimer's Association now, but used to be with uh, at Albany Med with at the mm -hmm. Alzheimer's Centers of Excellence, which are more diagnostic in nature. And I remember you saying to me um, that there are over 50 um, health and medical or prescription drug interactions that can sometimes mimic memory loss. So another reason why you don't just assume automatically you have Alzheimer's disease or dementia, it could be something else. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. There are many things that mimic Alzheimer's disease and dementia, but are otherwise reversible. And we used to say back in the day, I don't know if the data is still correct, that as many as one out of 10 cases of what we what looks like Alzheimer's and dementia may have an, a, re, a reversible underpinning. Imagine that, imagine one out of 10 people in a room having something that looks like Alzheimer's or dementia, but perhaps it's a, a thyroid condition, perhaps it's vitamin B12 deficiency, perhaps it's hypos or hydrocephalus. Um, all of these things, treatable, treatable, easily treatable. And so another great reason to want to have that assessment early, if there's an underlying condition that can be reversed and modify those symptoms, you want to make sure that you do that. And secondly, you want to make sure that if it is Alzheimer's or dementia, you know it early so that you can access those state-of-the-art treatments coming down the pipeline. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for saying that because uh, it doesn't always necessarily mean Alzheimer's disease. Absolutely. Um, to major, I don't know if it, side effect is the right word, mm -hmm. um, for people with Alzheimer's disease and dementia are insomnia and agitation. Mm -hmm. I understand that there's medications now that mm -hmm. actually impact that positively. Absolutely. So, you know, we talk a lot about these medications that are um, either in the pipeline or in the case of lecanemab just been approved by the FDA for treatment of Alzheimer's disease specifically. But to your point, Greg, there are all kinds of these secondary symptoms um, and both insomnia and agitation are sometimes 
game changers for the quality of life for both the patient and the care partner. So we wanna do our best to treat those things. And as you know, Greg, some of the medications we use to treat insomnia or the, the drugs we've used to treat agitation in the past, boy, are they hard on people. And they have a whole host of side effects. So we have always wanted something gentler, if you will, better tolerated by the largely geriatric community. And so in 2020, Belsomra was approved by the FDA for the treatment of insomnia in individuals in any stage of Alzheimer's disease. And just this year, the medication Rexalti was approved by the FDA for Alzheimer's agitation. And I know some people are using it for that frustration, that anxiety ridden agitation that we see in Alzheimer's disease. And I've heard from several families that it has really added so much to their quality of life. That's, that's amazing. Um, Beth, what, resor what resources do you guys have available? What I really love about the Alzheimer's Association, not only the, the national 24 seven hotline, but your, your chapters are a one stop. And, and, you know, in a, in a siloed caring economy, regardless of if it's health, long-term care, or social services, it's, we don't always have that, but you can go to the Alzheimer's associations in your area and what kinds of resources would people find there? Absolutely. So in addition to our 24 seven helpline, which you can see there and our website, which is of course available 24 seven and has topic sheets that you can download, information that you can access. Um, we have 75 chapters throughout the nation, seven of which are here in New York State. I come from the Northeastern New York chapter, just um, moments away from your office in Albany, Greg. And um, we provide six core services at every chapter around the nation. That includes information and referrals. So if you need a list of the doctors in Albany or a list of the doctors in Lake Placid or Lake George, I can get you that list. Um, if you are looking for more in-depth information, sitting down for a one-to-one -one with a dementia expert, that's called a care consultation. We offer those in our office or in the community. We serve 17 counties. And so we have a great ge uh, geographic area that we cover. So we have program managers all the way up to the Canadian border and all the way down here to the Albany area. So you can meet with a care consultant to get that advice that your family needs or just simply disease education to be introduced to this. We also provide support groups at my chapter. We have 37 support groups. Some of them are specialty groups. So we have a male caregiver group because oftentimes the men find themselves in a different position. They, um, in many circumstances, talking about this generation, they weren't people who prepared meals, cleaned a house, did the laundry, and they find themselves facing different challenges than other caregivers. And that's a terrific group and, and a, a whole lot of fun. We also provide early stage engagement programs. So we have an eight week course for people that just begin this journey to attend with their care partners. And we uh, fill that with expert speakers who come in and talk about um, the importance of legal and financial planning, research opportunities that are available, new treatments, partnering with your doctor, and then of course the, the resources available in the community. And then lastly, Greg, one of our key programs is linking people to safety services. Six out of 10 people with this disease will wander and get lost at least once, many for as much as 24 hours. And so it's critical that people have the safety services needed. And of course, you know, I had to put on a heavy coat this morning, Greg, we know what that means. We're heading into an even more dangerous time for those people that have a proclivity to wandering. Yeah. So, you know, anybody listening either today live or in the future, just go to the website. Uh, there mm -hmm. is a litany of tools uh, for you there. I want to talk a little bit um, about reducing the risk. So mm -hmm. I think people think that Alzheimer's disease is a normal process of aging, but it is not. Mm -hmm. And I know that ways to significantly reduce your risk of getting it over time are staying engaged, not being lonely and isolated. Number one, controlling your blood pressure, eating well, and exercising. That's Are right. there other things that people can do to reduce their risk in addition to those four things that I just talked about? 
There are, but I think I, I want to comment on that first and then tell you about something really exciting that came out just this year. So what you're talking about, Greg, is really the, the, the things that we've done for many, many years to protect our health, our, excuse me, our heart health. And what happened when many, many Americans started to adopt a heart healthy diet, when they started to exercise, we saw a huge um, decline in the number of strokes in the United States, right? So we were able to make that link to heart health and stroke and reduce the amount of stroke. Well, one of the things that we learned because of the Sprint Mind study that was published in 2018 is that if we maintain a low systolic blood pressure under 120 and take good care of our heart, that means eating a heart healthy diet and engaging in aerobic exercise, we can reduce our risk of Alzheimer's and dementia by as much as 20%. Add cognitive and social stimulation to that and we could reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease by as much as 40%. So why is that? Well, I think it's pretty simple. 25% of the blood that is part of that is pumped from the heart goes directly to the brain. The heart gives all of our organs the fuel it needs, and that's blood. Without that blood flow and without the oxygenation that results from that blood flow, the brain becomes more susceptible to diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, all of them. So when we protect our heart, we protect ourselves against vascular disease and Alzheimer's and other dementias. In addition to that, we've been studying sleep. And we know that individuals who don't get good sleep are more at risk for developing Alzheimer's and dementia. And think about that, Greg. When any of us don't have a good night's sleep, we don't feel as sharp and ready to engage in our world as we do when we do have a good night's sleep. And imagine that over the course of a lifetime, not getting, not getting that good sleep is definitely going to affect our cognitive health. But most interesting and published in 2023, just released at the Alzheimer's International Conference is hearing loss. Mm -hmm. And to me, this has huge public health implications. So you and I've been in this business for a long time, Greg, and we know how important sensory deprivation can be to people with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. If you're not hearing things properly, then you are missing some of what's happening in your world. So it's easy to assume that that's the reason that hearing loss is a risk for developing dementia. Hmm. But it turns out it's a lot more than that. John, Johns Hopkins University, Dr. Frank Lynn, the principal investigator shared at this year's Alzheimer's conference that the challenge that happens for people that don't hear well is that the nerve cells in the brain have to work very hard to decode information that isn't otherwise heard. And therefore those nerve cells become susceptible to damage from diseases like Alzheimer's disease. He goes on to say that people who have severe untreated hearing loss are at five times greater risk than other individuals of developing Alzheimer's disease. Wow. I, and I'm sorry, to, I, I, one more thing I know, have to say. I'm just because, say I'm so glad I asked you this question, keep going. Well, the public health implication for this is extraordinary because he goes on to say that in other countries where hearing aids are reimbursed, the rates of dementia are lower. So. This is an easy one, Greg. This is one I think we can fix. The reimbursement for hearing aids for so many Americans that have hearing loss might not only help them remain engaged with their world, but may reduce the risk of Alzheimer's and dementia. Wow, I, I, that's fascinating. I'm so glad I asked you that question. Thank you. Um, we're gonna take a break. Earlier this month, the New York State Office for Aging, uh, like we always do every year, um, honored over 90 volunteers, which represent the million volunteers in New York State that contribute 495 million hours of service at an economic value of $13.8 billion every single year for Older New Yorkers Day. Uh, the nutrition program is a huge um, program in New York State that relies on volunteers. Take a look at this.
Thanks, Alex. So, so we're back. Great. Can I just say, we, you and I didn't script this or plan this, but one of the other sessions I was most fascinated by at the Alzheimer's conference this summer was one that suggests that volunteers, senior volunteers, reduce their risk of developing dementia as well. So kudos right. to those volunteers and thank you for them. Nope, and that's exactly right. And I believe one out of every seven jobs in New York State is for a not-for-profit without older volunteers from polling places to, um, you know, uh, YMCA's, uh, vet services, and of course the aging network, we would not have uh, the service infrastructure that we have in New York. So our, our volunteers are amazing and you're absolutely right. Uh, there are huge benefits to that. So um, Beth, before we get into um, any questions that we have from our audience, is there anything that I didn't ask you that you want to let folks know or reiterate something again um, that uh, we did talk about? Yeah, sure. I just think the one thing we always like to clarify is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia. And, and we've done it in years past, but just in case we've got new folks joining us this year, it is probably the question we're asked most commonly by people. And thanks, Alex, for that graphic. So when we talk about dementia, we're really talking about a syndrome or a general term, an umbrella term that describes a change in two or more areas, including memory, reasoning, verbal skills, personality, other thinking skills. And there can be many, many different types of dementia. So we can have vascular dementia if we've had one or more strokes. MS can cause dementia, Parkinson's can cause dementia, but far and away the most common form of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. So if your loved one is, has been labeled as having dementia, you really want to ask what type of dementia it is, particularly as new treatments emerge, because you wanna make sure that you're accessing everything that's out there. I often suggest that families think about this as though they were speaking to a primary care doctor who mentioned that perhaps they may have cancer. The next step a family would take would be to go to an oncologist, a specialist, and find out what kind, what's the prognosis, what's the treatment, what should I do next? And we want all New Yorkers, all Americans, everybody to be thinking that same way about the term dementia. Ask the doctor, okay, what type of dementia is this? What's the treatment? What's the prognosis? And what do I do next? Yeah. And I think, you know, to your point, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, the impact of loneliness and isolation on mm -hmm. your increasing your risk of, of dementia, you go to a doctor, you have blood work done and they're looking for certain things. They take your blood pressure, right? Can you imagine if we screened for things like isolation, loneliness, and then to you, your topic specifically, there are now two new drugs and you just, you, you talked about if you can get in early, um, if it's something other than dementia or Alzheimer's disease, it can be reversed. But if it is, there are huge results to this. So sure. it's so important. And as you said earlier, um, this now is a, what we've learned, it's a public health issue. Um, and there's things that we can do um, our, ourselves. So uh, we'll go to some questions from, from the audience for Beth. Please don't be shy. She is, as you can see, she's amazing and uh, quite an expert. Um, so we'd love to take your questions. Here we go. What if I notice a couple of little changes with a parent? How do I know if it's the start of Alzheimer's or just the natural aging process? Well, great question, because that comes up so often. And especially, Greg, you and I know a lot of folks are going to be visiting from out of town perhaps spending time with their parents over Thanksgiving or over the Christmas holidays. And they're gonna notice things perhaps that they didn't see or pick up when they were on the telephone. One of the uh, subtleties of these uh, early, early changes that happen in Alzheimer's disease and dementia is that people are able to cover them through social conversation. And it's not until you live in the house for three or four days or you're visiting for long stints of time that you see, boy, there really is something to this. So if you notice a couple of little changes, what I would suggest that you do is make note of those things and see if they match up with those 10 warning signs that I spoke about earlier. Again, you can access those online 24 hours a day, seven days a week, or call any Alzheimer's Association office and we'll mail you that list of warning signs. 
So if you see two or more of those warning signs, you really should access an evaluation. Um, start with your primary care physician, particularly if it's a person that has known the, the loved one, your loved one for a period of time because they will know the background and the history of that individual. And then when you attend that visit or when you call the provider, make sure that you have that list of warning signs that you've noticed because oftentimes people are dismissed by the primary care doctor if the patient or family member says, oh, I've noticed a little forgetfulness. If you list four or five things, my mother has had difficulty with bill paying and she did it her whole life. She's repeating the same story over and over again. She got lost driving to the supermarket. You list those things and now it's undeniable. You have now listed four warning signs for Alzheimer's disease. So be clear about your messaging. Make sure you use that warning sign document to um, give you the narrative that you want to have with the physician. If after a, a series of tests, the physician determines that this is okay, this is normal aging, then that's fine. What you've done is to create baseline data for yourself so that if a year or two down the road, you notice more changes, you have that baseline assessment. There is no harm to getting these assessments. And in fact, Greg, you and I are both proponents of everybody over the age of 65 having them annually like we do other screens. Mm -hmm. Yep. Nope. You're, you're, you're exactly right. Um, that's a great question and a spectacular answer. Do you have any online support groups for dealing with the grief that comes with dealing with a parent with Alzheimer's during the holidays? Great question. It is a great question. We don't have any online support groups that deal specifically with that. But what we do have is other support groups where people are um, either have grieved uh, a loss of somebody with Alzheimer's disease or are in the process of what we call anticipatory grief. Uh, many people with this disease will say that they're losing their loved one one day at a time because as those memories are lost, as the ability to identify family members is lost, that's a loss. That's a, a grief that individuals see while their loved one is still very much here, very much present. And so I would recommend one of two things, participating in one of our general support groups, and we again have them online hybrid or in person, or talking with a care consultant, just to have someone to talk to about what you've experienced and how to move forward with after your experience with this disease. Yeah. And I, th I think, you know, the, the question was very specific to grief, um, but the folks in the support group are all kind of dealing with the same thing. So That's it right. kind of, uh, you know, organically would meet that need of that question. Um, what again are the uh, warning signs of early stage dementia? Sure. So we start with that memory loss. And again, typically pretty uh, specific to storing the new data. So individuals have difficulty making new memories, if you will, while their old memory can be quite well preserved for many, many years. Uh, then there's difficulty with word retrieval. Now it's normal for everybody to have a little bit of trouble as they age with coming up with that word, the name of the guy they saw on the television. But when you see it persistent and when you see it really interfere with an individual's ability to communicate, that's an issue. Personality or behavioral changes that center around sadness or depression or accusing others of taking things that they have otherwise misplaced repeating the same story over and over and over again. Difficulties with multitasking. So perhaps you notice a parent that was able to put together a Thanksgiving meal flawlessly, now having trouble, one item gets burned, another item is still cold because they can't multitask through that complicated meal. And difficulties with mathematical, anything mathematical, anything numeric is another very common sign of early Alzheimer's disease. And then lastly, the inability to uh, reason as well as once one did and very concrete thinking comes into play in the early stage of this disease. So if you notice people that have a little difficulty understanding a joke or some sarcasm, that again can be a sign of early disease because again, that inability to think abstractly. 
Great. And again, those are all um, the Alzheimer's Association uh, website. Um, do we have any more questions, Alex? All right, we'll do one more. Sometimes it seems difficult to get through to doctors about concerns for a loved one who is declining. That is very true. So can you reiterate those tips again that you provided? And I think you were talking about establishing a baseline, better safe than sorry, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. I think to be as specific as we can be with a physician. So use the 10 warning signs as the template for your narrative. And then again, make sure that you stress that this is not just a little bit of memory loss. This is not just normal aging. And you know that there are things you can do now. There are treatments or there are clinical trials for other treatments that are available. And you want your loved one to have the ability to access or at least make a choice about what they might want to do. You want your family to have the ability to plan early and accurately. And so you have to demand that this issue be addressed. Um, so that would be the one thing I would say. The second thing I would say is that if you have a loved one who simply does not recognize their ailment, if you will, and most people will call us and say, my mother is in complete denial and I can't even talk to her at all about this. If that's your circumstance, and it doesn't happen with everybody, but it happens with many people. If that's your circumstance, again, compile your list and then call your loved one's primary care doctor and say, I have grave concerns about my parent, my parent or my loved one, excuse me. My loved one doesn't recognize these signs, but they are very obvious and they include X, 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 and X. What do I do next? And oftentimes the physician's office will work with you and suggest that your loved one come in for an annual physical or something else during which time the doctor can begin to address these things. So the family member doesn't become the bad guy, the doctor becomes the bad guy in that scenario, which is a lot easier to take on. But it's tricky for so many families. And again, that's what our care consultants are there for. So if you have one of those situations where you have a family member who is hell bent on not going, then try that. I have a wonderful success story, Greg. I met with a woman myself probably six or eight months ago, and they have a very small family, but it's uh, her sister that she was very concerned about. And her sister was absolutely not, no way was she going to talk to a doctor about this. This was just normal. She was forgetting things, but her sister knew there was more to this. And so she kept pressing and pressing and pressing. And she made that list. She called the doctor in advance. She went with her sister to the doctor's appointment. And so just about a month ago on a Friday morning, I walked into our conference room and it was our early stage engagement program. And there was a speaker coming. And I always love, just like you're on your field trip today, I always love to pop in and see our groups in action. And I walked in and there they were. So in six months, they had come from being in a position where there was no recognition of these symptoms to getting a diagnosis and participating in this eight week program. So it can happen. It's discouraging and hard for families who have a loved one who doesn't see their impairment early on, but you can turn the, the course. Yeah, and it's just amazing, really. Um, you know, I think we first had you on for this, not Alzheimer's disease, but the holiday edition mm -hmm. three years ago. And just to think how far we've come just from that conversation yeah. um, is is incredible. So, uh, I mean, Beth, this is amazing. It's always great to have you. Um, we will, of course, have you back. Um, I can't thank you for what you do, um, what you have done, what you currently do, and I know what you will continue to do. It's really just a, a blessing and a great service uh, that you're here in New York State. So thank you so much. Uh, yeah. For those who are listening or will be, please check out the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, One-stop shop for the things that you need. Don't be afraid to pick up the phone. You know, the what's great about them is you're actually going to get a human being on the other end of the line, which uh, is, is nice these days. And check out the Al's store uh, for gift ideas um, uh, during this holiday season. 
Um, we're going to wrap up. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. I want to remind people, take the TEPSAT. doesn't take that long. Planning is critically important. Don't forget your flu shot, your COVID booster, if you haven't gotten those yet either. And I, as always, this production would not be made possible without our communication staff, Alex, Darren, and Roger. Thank you all so much. Have a safe and wonderful and happy Thanksgiving. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Live with Greg is a production of the New York State Office for the Aging Communications Bureau. Please make sure to join us next time.